of Hollywood for YouTube, joined by the writer of Halloween 6, Daniel Ferens. We're here to discuss Halloween 6, the movie, and the late, great Mitchell Ryan. So, when did you first start writing this wonderful movie? Well, that's very kind of you to say thank you for that. Um, I started writing Halloween 6 in the spring, early summer of 1994. And by that fall, we were in production and shooting in Salt Lake City, Utah. What was the... I, I do believe Halloween 4 was filmed there as well. And 5, yep. And 5. So yep. what was it like in Utah for Halloween? Oh, gosh. I mean, very cold. We we The interesting thing about, I mean, many things about our film, but, but in particular, that we shot the movie in, you know, at, at Halloween time uh, when, you know, the leaves were turning colors and... And everything had that really, you know, brisk kind of very colorful, lush kind of fall look to it. So none of that stuff in our movie was, you know, like PAs off camera throwing leaves at the at the screen <laughs> like they did in the earlier Halloweens. A lot of those movies, and I think to this day, are still all filmed in the spring. But we had the good fortune to shoot in the fall. Um, so it really lent itself to, you know, a really nice atmosphere. So, but the one thing though, is what they didn't predict was we were going to have, they were going to have an early winter, um, hit Salt Lake city that year and things got very cold, very fast. And it, in fact, I think after the first week of shooting, it started to snow. Oh, wow. So a lot of scenes that were intended to be outdoor scenes became indoor scenes. It, it's really interesting because when you watch the movie, it, you can see the very fall like atmosphere, but you can't, you don't see the snow. Right? No, we, I mean, again, it's, it's, that's the miracle and the magic of making movies is, you know, uh, luckily I think we got enough footage of the exteriors that we needed to get during the, you know, the period of time before it started snowing. But I will tell you, I remember even on that first, first day, the very first day of filming was where the, the dad, uh, John Strode, with his bathrobe, <laughs> was out, you know, chopping down a sign and scaring little kids off the, his lawn, and that was the very first shot of the movie, as I recall. But it, it was it was freezing, I and mean, it was so cold you could barely feel your hand. So you, we knew that you know the weather was not going to be our friend. Yeah, it, beautiful film, by the way. Oh well, thank you. It really is. And I, you know, credit. I mean, I wrote the screenplay, but. Uh, but Joe Chappelle was the director and Billy Dixon was the wonderful director of photography. And I, you know, got to give them credit as well. Right. How, how important do you think that is to have a great director of cinematography? Oh, I mean, it's hugely important. And I, now I've gone on and directed several films of my own. And I think there it's, it's just really what the partnership is, is, you know, it's the director having a, a concept of what, the story is and how he wants to tell that story, but it's really that director of photography, the cinematographer and his team of, you know, electricians and grips and all of the amazing craftsmen that come in and, and you know, make it all happen. Uh, I mean, that's a huge part of the collaboration of making a movie is between the director and the cinematographer, and it, it can't be overstated. You wrote some amazing new characters in this story. Uh, Kim Darby's character, Deborah Strode, John Strode, Kim, Kim Strode, uh, Megan Higgins' character, Kara Strode. Is was there one character that that's your favorite? Was your favorite to write for? Hmm. I, well, all of them, I guess, because every you know everything you write, even if it's a genre movie or a sequel, like a Halloween movie, you know, you're still kind of writing what you know, you know? So, I mean, there are weirdly elements of my own upbringing in that family, <laughs> uh, maybe in some of the not so great parts, but but um, but yeah, I think I related to this weird dysfunctional family dynamic quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I think the mom, you know, Kim, the Kim Darby, I thought played beautifully, um, was sympathetic and, you know, you felt for her and you wanted her to, you know, kind of get out of that house with that suitcase. And um, and I do remember the audience really responding to her and to that sequence. But, um, but yeah, no, it's all fun. And I think the one, the, the but longer answer to your question is I think the one, the, the one character that was most difficult to write for me was Loomis, knowing that, you know, the script would soon be in the hands of the actual, the late, great Donald Pleasance, who 
you know, I just didn't feel worthy of, of writing those lines for him, those speeches and the first Halloween were so almost Shakespearean, you know, I mean, they're so unforgettable. And I think that's all a testament to John's Carpenter's writing ability. But, you know, when I, when I embraced it, I just embraced it. And I, you know, you draw on the character that you know from the other films, but you also kind of bring your own sort of flavor to it. But what I didn't know at the time, um, that once Donald gets the script, Donald make, made it his own. He took the words, but he kind of made them ha the way he wanted to say them. And that actually, as I learned later, was true even when he made the first Halloween. He actually did quite a bit of, you know, improving with the dialogue, as, I guess you could say. You know, not that they weren't John's words or his intentions, but but he takes that intention and he makes it so much more. You know, it's he's that he was that kind of great actor that could interpret something that in a, in a way that you you didn't envision. And that's, again, that's just the mark of a great, talented, talented actor that he was. I think that's something we, if you don't mind me saying, we don't see enough of today where these sure. are, where mm -hmm. actors, and I do think actors are still trained today the way they were back then, but the actors like Donald Pleasance, even Mitch Ryan, they were trained actors. They were stage yeah. actors first. Yeah, it came from that that very kind of like, you know, dramatic school of acting, the theater, as you said. I mean, there was, there, again, I, I keep, I always use the word Shakespearean when I think of yeah. that character, Sam Loomis, who, you know, transcended so much. You know, I think he made that movie, gave it a gravitas of believability. You know, you you really understood who he was, but you also were um, intimidated by this man. You know, he seemed sort of scary in his own way in that first film. Um, and I think that was all just a testament to John's uh, incredible vision and, and, and concept of what this was, and that he was this kind of, almost like a Van Helsing kind of character. Like he knows something that this little town doesn't know, and he's here to warn them, and he's here to, you know, hopefully deal with this before terrible things strike and we know what happened so but but i think you know donald was uh, incredibly gracious and kind and um you know just happy to be there again one more time as we didn't know obviously at the time it would that at the moment it would be his last foray into the world of halloween but he embraced it he loved it he was thrilled to be a part of it again um, I, we were all just a bunch of young kids around him and were sort of in awe of his greatness. And, but when he walked onto that set for the first time, I think we all kind of felt like, oh my God, you know, like, especially me being such a fanboy and getting this incredible opportunity when I was so young, but it just all became very real very quickly <laughs> when he showed up with the, you know, with the, with the walk and the, you know, that little glint in his eye, you just you knew Loomis was on the on the case, and it was just magical. It really was. It's there's like, I think I've heard you say once, there's like, there will never be another Donald Pleasance. Absolutely. And there, will, I agree. There, there just won't be. I think there was, there's something about him. Mm -hmm. But what, Marion Hagen's character? Here's this brand new character. And I gotta say to you, she's my favorite female protagonist ever in the Halloween. Uh, so nice, you know, and she's such a wonderful, genuinely kind and thoughtful human being, not to mention extremely intelligent. Um, I think that would really, you know, make her feel very good that, you know, somebody loves her the most out of all of the, you know, the, the so-called final girls of the series. Listen, she she brought a lot to the role, and I think that she played a kind of a version of, of Jamie Lee's character, but but came to it with more baggage. You know, her character lived more. She had this surprise pregnancy and had this young son, and she was had the weight of the world on her shoulders, in a sense. And I think Marianne carried that really well, and um, she had a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of heart in her performance. I thought she was very sympathetic. In many ways, the new trilogy focuses on the Me Too movement, but she was sort of the first character. Mm. She was going through, her father was a domestic abuser, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, he was. Not a nice guy. It, it, that's, like you said, weight of the world on her shoulders. She not only has to deal with a domestically abusive father, but here's this serial killer who's... Right. 
absolutely evil. You right. Know? I mean, in a way, you know, in the way I thought of it, and, you know, as a writer, you're always trying to think, you know, bigger pictures and themes and things like that. And I, and to me, what it meant was that, you know, all of this family drama that you saw at the beginning was was kind of a metaphor for the bigger thing that she had to conquer later, that Michael was, in a, in, in a sense, the metaphor for the, the problems that the family was having, and she had to find her inner strength and, and, and face up against, face off against this, this monster, this, you know, dark kind of thing that was terrorizing her, you know, and I think she plays a little more in that sort of breakfast scene at the beginning of the movie, and she, you know, she... Not that she takes her lumps, but I and I think she really, you know, gives it back to her father. This is something, you know, she's that line about, you know, there's only one bastard in this house. So she doesn't take it laying down, but you can see that she's subservient. You can see that she doesn't have the strength or the um the bravery to to walk out, you know, and and to find her own way. I mean, I you know, my in my imagination, this young woman was, you know, out of money and out of resources, and she was sort of forced to go back to live with her family. And uh, again, all of that, you know, it's all subtext. It's not in the movie, but I, th I think all of those little ideas are there. And I think if you, you know, if you want to take a, a bigger 30,000 mile view of the movie <laughs> and, and all those who still care all these years later, which I thank you for your interest. But but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's kind of what's about, you know, like the Michael is this. And I think in all the Halloweens, it's true. You know, he's, he's a metaphor for something bigger. He represents evil in whatever form or shape you want to call it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally agree with you that she you could tell that she she does she doesn't want to be there. She has to be there in every way. Right. That's true. She, she I, me personally, I come from a domestically abused home, so I know mm. you know, it's like you want to see her like leave. Yeah, but she, she can't and she needs to support her son as well. For sure. And, so you feel really sorry for her. It was, again, well-written characters. Listen, not... I, I, I mean, first of all, I just want to, you know, I'm sorry that you have had to have that experience in your life because it's, it's, it's not acceptable ever. But, um, but you know what I'm glad of to hear, though, is that that character resonated with you and maybe you identified with her. And I think that's what you always want in your leads, especially in a horror movie where so much of it is about, you know, violence and and, you know, heads being bashed in, <laughs> knives being <laughs> flung across the screen. And, you know, and there's the bloodletting part of these movies, I think, that are so, you know, chilling and why we go to them, because you're kind of vicariously experiencing something that is so dangerous and taboo and, and frightening. You know, it's like the things that we have nightmares about. And yet it's, you know, you've got the safety of it being a story being told to you on a, a big screen. But, but yeah, I think I think if, if, you, if you don't have the heart of a, a character if, if she doesn't capture something in you i think in, and that's again G full credit jamie lee curtis you know was the she's the scream queen for a reason you know her portrayal was so sympathetic and even though she didn't have the weight of the world on her shoulders like like our lead did like kara strip did her distant cousin i am assuming um that that you know you understood that she was this kind of repressed girl who didn't really get the dates and she wasn't in step with the other kids as much and she was studious and responsible and you know and i and i've always sort of argued like that the that the final girl of the movie isn't always necessarily virginal but she's usually pretty virtuous yeah. you know she's she's there's something about her that she sees things that maybe the other characters who are a little more caught up in their own dramas and lives i think when you've been the victim of abuse like you know i think you see the world differently and i think you see it from perspective of you're more careful because you have to be you're yeah. more thoughtful because it, sometimes that's the difference between getting beaten up or not and i think you when you've been victimized you you, you approach life from a different point of view so that that's a little bit of what i was going for with her but thank you for recognizing that Especially when you're a parent, too, because it's not just you you have to worry about. Oh, my about. gosh, yeah. Add another complication, right? <laughs> you got it, a, it's, a helpless it's, child. Yeah, it's, it's your kid. It's your her mm -hmm. son. And mm -hmm. the, I love how uh, Terrence Wynn is in the room as the man of black. And he says, kill for me, Danny. I was like, I was like oh, holy crap. Mm -hmm. um, what did you, Danny Strode, young Danny Strode, mm -hmm. he's very... 
a very unique character. Mm-hmm. Can you like, just take me into your mind for a moment? I love that character. Listen, I mean, listen, I mean, some people like kind of were like, well, how narcissistic of you, you name the character after yourself. I'm like, well, nope, wrong. Uh, I mean, sure. Yeah, but, you know, I'm, I'm Dan. Uh, but that wasn't the intention. The intention was that he was kind of a, a bit of a winked nod to Danny Torrance in The Shining because he was sort of uh, telepathic. You know, he had some kind of, you know, obviously in The Shining, he was, he was much more, his, his, his sense of, uh, the, we'll call it the third eye, was much more acute than, <laughs> than the boy in Halloween 6. But we were hinting at the fact there was some telepathic connection going on with this child. He was seeing things, he was hearing voices, and, you know, and, and, and obviously all of this stuff is going back to the beginning of what happened to, potentially happened to Michael Myers when he was that age, that he was inducted into this dark group of people who had sinister motives and, you know, were kind of reliving the, what the, what the origins of the, the celebration of Sam Hain, Samhain, uh, and, and what Halloween really meant, the origins of the holiday itself. And I think we were just kind of playing with that mythology more in, in Halloween 6. It had all been there. It was in 1 to a certain extent, but certainly Halloween 2 absolutely went down that road. Um, so I just kind of picked it up from there. You know, I took a little bit of everything that, that John had kind of suggested in, in 1 and 2 and then tried to marry that mythology into what we had seen in four and five and then you know because we kind of had to deal with this man in black like who the heck is that guy nobody knew who that was supposed to be uh at least anybody who made halloween five had no clue who that weird guy with the boots and the black hat and the big long trench coat was supposed to be you know and and that was yeah go ahead i'm sorry Uh, us fans had a lot of suggestions oh of course yeah i mean yes (laughs) And, you know, I didn't go in with a very specific idea other than as I was talking to Mustafa Akkad and his son Malik and, and the other producer, Paul Freeman, on the film, you know, it was like, who's the guy? You know, that was really the number one question on, on Mr. Akkad's mind when he was looking for somebody to tackle this. And the couple things that I said to him were Rosemary's Baby, um... And, and that was it. That was it. Was it was when I said Rosemary's Baby meets Halloween, right. he instantly got the concept. And from there, we kind of just I started extrapolating. And and he had mentioned, and I think it was Malik that had said somebody in the mental institution, you know, in Smith's Grove. And I said, well, you know, there's this character from the original movie, Doctor Wynn, and he's in that one scene, and it's kind of weird, and he's saying things about Loomis is complaining that you know. Somebody around the, the hospital might have taught this, this guy how to drive a car. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, where do we, we could take that somewhere. That's interesting. You know, what if the people in the sanitarium or who were running it or were part of it were somehow involved in, in the kind of almost indoctrination of this boy? You know, I mean, it kind of all goes back to the satanic panic that we've had back in the 80s. That was still kind of on people's minds when we did Halloween 6. You know, there were all kinds of stories of like the movies. I mean, it's still happening today, for God's sakes. You know, they're talking about Pizzagate and all these crazy, you know, theories that are out there. But, but at that time, you know, there were there were stories that you would hear of, and it all was very creepy that, you know, there was this kind of psych- satanic underground that was, you know, infecting our society. And, you know, so there was that. And, I, and again, really, though, beyond that, it was all going back to this idea of Sam Hain being the night when... The, the, the souls of the dead would return to the, to the living and that there was this, this boogeyman, almost like an avatar, who would exact human sacrifices. And, and in, in a way, it was in those pre-Christian days that, that you know, when crops may not be plentiful and, and they didn't understand the change of seasons as much as we do now, and there was a scarcity and a famine and a and disease where you know and and we didn't they didn't have an understanding of the things we do today and that in those early early dark days they believed in this boogeyman and so we took that idea and we kind of ran with it there's actually a, a really really interesting and a lot of fans know about this you might as well but there's a really great prologue to the uh novelization of the first halloween um 
like Curtis Richards is the pen name. Um, but it's a 20 or so page backstory of Michael Myers. Uh, all the, going all the way back to his family's origin in the Druid times and how it how his soul kind of went on and on and on and it never died. And that's I used a little bit of that stuff without drawing on it specifically, but I you know that informed some of what I was thinking. See, I've never read the novels. Mm. It's really I, worth it's worth that one's worth picking up because it's it gives you that little prologue. And there's even a whole I don't know ten pages or so devoted to Loomis and him trying to kind of understand who this little boy is when he's locked up in the hospital. And all of these kind of really creepy, violent things happening to all the people within Smith's Grove, you know, I, who he believes that Michael was you know, responsible, even though he's a, a boy who doesn't speak and barely moves. You know, that all of these kind of strange, violent occurrences start to happen around the hospital. And that's where Loomis is like, oh, no, 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 no. This kid is something more. <clears throat> so that's that's all in the novelization of the film. It's really brilliant. I love the cult of Thorn. The Again, all of that stuff came out of, you know, Halloween, Halloween 2, the novelization, and also a need to kind of tie some pieces in, you know, with, with 4 and 5, and the telepathy between Jamie and her uncle that they did in 5, and, you know, a lot of things kind of went astray on Halloween 6. The, the script, I think, had much bigger ideas um, that probably weren't executable on the budget. Uh, and certainly with the weather conditions. <laughs> so, you know, I just, it was, it was disappointing when, when you saw big swaths of pages and scenes that were so, I felt important to the telling of the story, just kind of, you know, well, sorry, we didn't have time for that. Or, oh, well, it's snowing out. We can't shoot that one. So, you know, that was, that was tough. I will, J.C. Brandy as Jamie Lloyd was amazing. She did a great job. Yeah, and I think she, you know, I think she knew she was stepping in. I don't think she knew how big the shoes were she was stepping into. Um, I kind of knew. Mr. Akkad knew, but unfortunately, the, the 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 people who wrote the checks from the studio were not. Let's just say on the Daniel Harris wagon that even though Daniel had committed to making the movie, she was excited about it. We were excited to have her. Um, there was a real energy about that. And I think she was thrilled to, you know, get the chance to work with Donald one more time. And, you know, this was important to her and it was important to all of us. However, it wasn't important enough for the studio to pay her a very reasonable salary. And she rightfully made a decision to not do the movie. It wasn't because of the part or because, you know, she didn't like something. It was just, it was purely because the the people that were, the, we'll call them the bean counters, were just treating her very poorly and unfairly. And that story's been told a lot. Wow. Thank but JC was so nice, and, and, and we are still friends to this day. And she and, she and Danielle, weirdly enough, are, are friends, have been for many years. Um, so it all kind of worked out. Um, but yeah, she was, you know, she was game. She was young. We're all kind of the same age in our early 20s, mid 20s. And just, you know, even Paul Rudd, we, we, he was just a guy, you know, another actor and he wasn't famous yet. And we were all just kind of hung out because it was cold and it was Salt Lake City. There's nothing to do at night there. Um, and we just kind of were, you know, we bonded and it was a really fun, special time. We were all thrilled to be a part of it. Yeah, I love, I love Paul Rudd's performance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he played I, in a very quirky way, but I think that 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 has obviously led him to a much much bigger and better movies <laughs> over the years. But no, listen, he he was so cool, and I remember playing pool with Paul and hanging out with him, you know, and having breakfast with him at the hotel we were staying, and and just you know watching movies and on VHS at night and. He just was a nice person and still is. And, and just, we, again, I can't emphasize enough how excited we all were to just be a part of this movie and how much it all meant to all of us. You know, and then, you know, having Donald on the set and I remember Marianne and he, Marianne was a very, came from like, you know, a very theatrical background as well. So I think she really bonded with Donald about, you know, his, 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 work, his work on stage. You know, I think that's what she was very interested in. So they spent a lot of time chatting about that and, it was, you know, it was a really cool, special time. And, and I think, you know, the movie has its detractors and its haters and whatever. Every movie does, and I don't care anymore. But um, 
listen, I mean, it's it's part of the series. It was a huge step forward for me in my career, in my life, and I don't regret a single moment of it. It was all just great. I I remember during you know, September that I saw it on the sign for the theater, and uh -huh. we were going on vacation, my parent, my mom, and me. Mm -hmm. my and I said, Mom, please, please. Don't <laughs> it. And my mom introduced me to horror, the first movie. Oh, wow. oh that's cool. And me and my brother was John Carpenter's Halloween. But your movie, Halloween 6, was the first Halloween I saw in theaters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and yep. I, I said this to you on Facebook. And I, we, she took us to go see it not only before we left, but after we came back, too. Aww. Well, that's a cool bomb. I mean, you know, I think there are, the, you know, that's pretty cool. My mother wouldn't let us see, well, she, not that she didn't let us, but she certainly wasn't very supportive of my interest in the genre at all. So I do remember when Halloween 2 came out, dating myself a bit here, but but we had to we had to ask the guy in front of us in line to buy the tickets because they wouldn't sell them to us because we, we weren't old enough. <laughs> so, and he was super cool. He was like, sure, yeah, these kids are with me. So anyway, whoever that guy was, I, I thank you. You changed the course of my life. <laughs> definitely, definitely. You had Kim Darby, who you know, mm -hmm. was from True Grit. And, uh -huh. Yep. And you had the... Super cool cast. Yeah, it really was. I love... Why? Because I'm a huge Dark Shadows fan as well. Mm -hmm. Why Mitchell Ryan as the man, as Dr. Terrence Wynn? You know, it's interesting. I wasn't part of the kind of decision making, you know, committee to that, that, that really was involved in the decisions on the casting side of the film. But, you know, I would kind of get updates, you know, on kind of who they were thinking of and, and all of that. And listen, I mean, Mitch Ryan was really well known at the time. He was in Lethal Weapon and he was, you know, it was, it was a pretty established character actor. In fact, he even, he played opposite Jamie Lee Curtis in um, one of her first breakout roles, which she played in Death of the Centerfold. He played Hugh Hefner and she played the doomed Playboy Centerfold, Dorothy Stratton, back in the early 80s. So there's a weird connection between Halloween one and Halloween six because you know Mitch Mitch had you know starred with Jamie Lee, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, no, he was he was you know listen, I remember what the specific you know criteria he met for the producers who were casting at the time, and I think I was probably busy rewriting script pages as I often was, um, but. You know, he was an interesting choice, and I, I mean, I've told this story before, but I had, in my mind, as I was writing the thing, and I had, you know, suggested it to the, the powers that be, that we think about Christopher Lee yeah. to play the role, because I knew, and in fact, I think around that time is right when the Criterion Laserdisc for Halloween, the original Halloween, came out, and I think on there, there was this really, really, and in those days, this was a new thing, you know, commentaries and things like that were really, really new. And so I had the laser disc and I listened to the commentary with, you know, rapt interest as a fanboy like me would. And, you know, it was Deborah Hill and John and, and Jamie Lee and they were, you know, recalling their experience making Halloween. But the one thing that Deborah Hill said on the track that really stood out to me was, you know, our first choice for um, Loomis was. Well, first was Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, and Christopher Lee turned the role down. And he later said that to her at some, you know, function in Hollywood, you know, premiere or something, that it was the biggest mistake of his career. <laughs> it, it gave Donald Pleasance a whole new life and a new generation of fans, and he regrets not taking the role. Right. And so that's when I went to the producers. And I said, "You guys, I mean, we have this is a, this is a this is a golden opportunity. You know, offer this other doctor part to have Chris Verley on screen with Donald Pleasance. I'm like, that's just horror gold right there. And they just didn't get it. You know, this is before the days of Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, and when Christopher Lee had his big Renaissance moment. Um, and they didn't get it. They didn't. They were like, eh, we don't want to upstage Donald. I don't think that's a good idea." You know, we don't need two, you know, guys of that era, of those Hammer film era and all of that in a movie like this. And I, I was really bummed. I was like, God, like what a what a cool moment, you know, like that 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 
that black hat comes off and the guy in the dark boots and everything, <laughs> it's fucking Christopher Lee. Um, so for me, that was my vision of the character. Uh, it, it wasn't Mitch, although I think Mitch did a, a fine job with the movie. Yeah, if you've ever seen him as Burke Devlin in Dark Shadows, oh my sure. god. Yeah, well, he's great. He's great. Again, he, he came in with his own pedigree and his own, uh, you know, notoriety in the in the world of, of not only as a, as a fine, you know, character actor, but, you know, also, like you said, Dark Shadows. And at that moment, he was still really, I think, you know, coming off a lethal weapon thing. Um, that was a few years down the road, but he was still known for that. And yeah, so again, I, I don't think that they made a terrible choice. I just, in my mind, I think we could have made a really, really cool choice. Um, in having Christopher Lee in the film with Donald. I, I do have a bonus DS question for you. Oh, did, sure. Did you see him in the Dark Shadows Christmas Carol special? I did not. I know exactly what you're talking about, though. No, but I did not. I will send it to you when we're done. Okay. Okay. <laughs> he did awesome. Um, Listen, he was awesome, and I, and I enjoyed awesome. working with him, and he was nice to everybody, and I think he was sort of um amused that we thought of him for this movie i <laughs> don't know why he, he just found it all kind of like wow you know this is so cool i mean again he was part of that whole group of all of us who were so enthusiastic and just really excited to be um part of this series and and i think at the time we were all like oh my god there's going to be six halloween movies like how can that be you know and now cut to today there's going to be 13. Is there any members of the Cult of Thorn left out there? Oh, God. Oh, I'm sure. Of course there are. I mean, Mrs. Blankenship is still around. Yeah. I mean, are, are you talking about in real life, or are you talking about, like, in the universe of the movie? In the universe of Halloween. In, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think... I th So the bigger idea with the cult was that we were going to find out if, if the story had continued the way we had talked about it into the seventh film, was we're going to find out a much bigger picture of this this organization and that they had infiltrated, you know, schools and libraries and all the safe places in small towns. And they were, it was, it was, you know, a conspiracy. It was like that thing, that nightmare that we all think like, Oh, who, who are, who's that nice lady who lives up the hall from me? <laughs> Which maybe she's not so nice. <laughs> so, you know, I think we had a bigger idea of, of the town of Haddonfield kind of being, you know, kind of, you know, a weird front for this this coven yeah so, yeah it was it was it was supposed to grow into a um you know it would have been explained more i think had the had the six movie been more successful and we and anybody had the the, had the temperature or appetite to uh, uh want to continue down that path but you know but no i mean listen i think i think all of those things are valid i get emails it's really funny to me from fans around the world and asking questions about that and you know, I think I, I'm just thrilled and, and always flattered that there's, you know, still a fan base for it and uh, present company included, of course. But um, but yeah, no, it's it's interesting, you know, like the, like the the life that the movie had at the time and and how it continues to be watched and shown on AMC every Halloween. And, you know, and there's always just been a, a tremendous interest in it, especially, you know, with the alternate version, the so-called producer's cut and all of those things that fans have really gotten excited about over the years. So it's, it's, it's just nice. I have a very strange question for you. Okay. Dr. Loomis was writing a book of memoirs at the beginning of the story in Halloween six when mm. Dr. Wynn interrupted him. Yes. Right. Like, thank you for interrupting me writing my memoir on Halloween Eve. Right. What, what happened to that memoir? Does someone have it or. I mean, I guess ask Rob Zombie. Didn't he pick up, something like that you know <laughs> like in his loomis thing didn't loomis write it like a terrible i mean his version of you know his loomis played by the great malcolm mcdowell um was much more kind of shrewd and you know kind of saw michael myers as almost like a commercial venture you know it's like how can i get rich off of this thing and you know i think in, i think in the rob zombie halloween's if i'm remembering correctly he wrote you know loomis had written a, a book kind of a, a tell-all about the case so i mean i in, in my own mind i'm like wink wink nudge nudge there's the there's the manuscript there it is i always have my own messed up theory about it. <laughs> but no i mean at the time i mean and i i know you know the loomis that i wrote 
for, and that was Donald, and that's who he was. Uh, for me, it was it was his own therapy for himself. That's why he was writing it. He just was trying to put it down finally, so he could put it away. You know, and I don't even know if he would have intended to write. I mean, to publish the book. I think he was writing it at that moment more for himself. And yeah, I don't think he had any designs of like approaching New York publishing houses with it. I think he was just doing it as a form of uh, self therapy. I always I, I joke with other friends of mine who are Halloween fans. I say, you know, maybe Donald Pleasance's character Sam Loomis was writing that memoir and secretly, mm-hmm. secretly, Donald Sam Loomis was an agent of the Shadow. Oh, that's, funny. <laughs> that's really funny. Listen, there's so many different weird paths you could go with it, and I think that's what's fun about the series, especially now. You know, it's like it's almost like choose your own adventure. You know, there's this timeline and that timeline and the other one. And then there's Halloween three that's off on its own. And, you know, I feel like the franchise has just taken off, you know, so many and there's so there's so many roots hanging from that vine at this point, you know, or tendrils hanging from that vine that it's just uh, it's kind of a grab bag of story potential, you know, and I, and I think I think, I, I, you know, it'll be interesting after the next and supposedly final movie comes out if you know, Michael Myers will return or if this franchise will continue in a different way, you know, maybe through a Netflix series or maybe through, you know, standalone movies like like Halloween three, you know, but Halloween more based on the holiday than than, you know, just a, a continuing series of Michael Myers slashers. You were around Donald Pleasant, so I need to ask you this. Mm-hmm. Do you think we should get a series about young Sam Loomis? It's been talked about, and not only that I has it been talked about, but it was something that I brought to them long, 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 long time ago. I mean, this is that's an idea that's been floating around for years, and it's something that I developed with the producers of Halloween, and there definitely was interest. You know, that's all I can say. So, um, you know, I would love to be a part of it if I, you know, even if it meant directing an episode or something like that would be super fun. But but yeah, I think there's a lot of mileage in some of those characters, you know, um, and there's so many little, you know, I don't know, offshoots that you could do. I mean, you could do an episode about, you know, old Charlie Bowles out in Russellville and he hacked yeah. up his family with that, you know, the hacksaw, you know, that there's an episode. Um, so, you know, there's there's all of these, again, story paths you could maybe take with it but yeah i think it's it's just it's great because halloween's got such a huge fan following and the mythology is so rich you know and i i i you know obviously i contributed to a little piece of it and and now david gordon green and all his people have contributed to it and and steve minor and i mean this is a long long list yeah it's an amazing franchise but what i love the character of tim strode and Ah. He did not know that the house he was living in belonged to Michael Myers. Well, I think had the script been followed a little more closely, I think you would have learned that the family was really new to Haddonfield. They weren't only there for a couple weeks, so they wouldn't have necessarily known. And that, that's, that's how that was sort of, in my mind, that they were just, they had, you know, maybe they had lived there at one time, but now they'd come back and now he'd taken over his brother's real estate business. And, oh, here's this house that's been sitting here. We'll, we'll moon do it. You know, so that was that was the notion. It wasn't that, you know, he lived there all his life and, and didn't know this. Right. When you when you watch the movie, I watch the movie like 10 times a year. Which is, oh, boy. <laughs> there's the mother, Deborah Strode, yep. says, set, can, when she's confronting her husband, she says, <laughs> You never told us. You mm-hmm. never, like so yeah. you know from her that they did not know. They didn't. No, I think he kept it. He knew because he, you know, he it was his, you know, I mean his brother was the father of Jamie Lee. That and yeah. you see him in the first movie and he's like, you know, drop the key off the Myers house. That that's in our story universe, that was his brother and yeah. uh, so, you know, they'd have a listing on this house for whatever number of years at that point what was it 18 20 25 years 35 whatever it was and uh you know um this 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 relative came to town we we actually had it was in the script originally that they were from chicago and had you know very very within the past you know 30 days to town to haddonfield to to just you know start this new take over the family business and you know kind of live the suburban life for a bit get out of the big city so that was the idea of this this 
faction of the Strode family. They came to, they were very new in town. You can see pieces of it in the movie. You know, you see moving boxes still around and things stacked up. You know, they weren't really settled into the house. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's the idea. They weren't, they weren't longtime residents. I, I love the characters. They're very, very amazing. The Cult of Thorn took up with, um, I must said Wincliffe. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wrong one. This Grove Horry County Sanitarium as their yep. sort of base. Mm -hmm. And they kidnapped Kara and yep. I and Danny, and they are just, they lock her in a room. Right. It's like, what are they going to do with her? And they have Danny right. sitting there. I love this whole final sequence. Mm -hmm. Really just well done. No, it's, it's it's bloody and it's kind of intense and everything. I, full disclosure, I wasn't, you know, so much a part of that revised ending, you know, as I think I would have liked to have been. I certainly was brought in to do a little work on it, but but they had other writers that contributed to all of that. And the director had a different style, vision in mind for what the ending was going to now be. And it was all very confusing to a lot of us that were part of it, you know, including Paul, including Marianne, including myself. Um, sadly, we had already lost Donald. He, he passed away that, you know, earlier in that same year in 1995. I think it was in February. And so by the time we got around to doing these, these this new photography, this, this, you know, these additional scenes, I guess they called them, um donald had passed and there was just a big it all just felt wrong you know and weird like it was a different crew it was a different dp it just none of it felt like we were getting together again to fix some stuff you know it all felt weird and so all of those other scenes that you're referring to were all shot in los angeles over a few days period and in the summer like literally weeks before the movie was scheduled to come out and it just was done fast without a whole lot of thought I felt put into the bigger picture and what movie this was and what story we're telling you know it was all kind of jettisoned for these kind of over the top you know bloody kind of moments and I just didn't for me didn't feel like it had any energy in terms of it feeling like it was attending to the story we'd already set up you know and, and it all kind of kind of for me just kind of comes crashing to the ground at that moment that's just me from the standpoint of the person that had conceived this whole thing so you know that was it was painful in a weird in a weird way but i mean i know that that version you know we call it theatrical version had its fans i know you like parts of it i just for me it just feels like we're just throwing things out against the wall to see what sticks at that moment because it's just the story just kind of goes it's like a it's like a cake that rises and then it just goes so it falls and for me it just didn't work and i think a lot of people would agree but it has some cool moments i think there's some good cool visual pieces like that that where he's massacring everybody in that room i don't know what they're doing in that room um but yeah it all it just all felt like where are we going with this what's the what's the intention of this stuff and it just never it just felt like a it, like there were 50 cooks in the kitchen and not one of them knew what what dish they were making do you wish you would have gotten to direct this and that would have been you know what? Of course, you know, and we can say that in hindsight about all kinds of things in our lives. I wish I had had maybe, maybe I was a little older or maybe I had more confidence. Maybe if, it, if I'd made a film of my own at that point, maybe I would have had the confidence to approach Mr. Akkad, who was always so generous with me and, and nice to me um, about just, hey, you know, I, I'm the guy with the vision of this. Let me direct it. I, I don't know what he would have said. And honestly, they had a new partner with Miramax and they were this brand new studio at the time. And I don't know if I would have pass the test to get to that I, I don't know but you know yes i mean did i and do i look at the movie and go oh my god i would have done that so differently had i been the one you know literally calling the shots but you can't you know i mean i think it's the movie is what it is and um you know i think it has its really interesting parts but i think it also has its plot holes and it's got its you know, all the seams sort of show, like it's not a seamless movie. And I think that's the problem with it. It just doesn't, 
have the like, there's not a singular vision to the film it's a lot of people's input that just is so it, it becomes kind of as big you know stew as opposed to a you know nice well-formed <laughs> constructed you know whatever you want to call it you know pr well presented five course meal it just felt like a grab bag of moments um and i think we had a really interesting setup i think all the stuff with the radio you know, you know shock chalk and it's kind of kind of connecting all these old characters with new ones and i loved all that stuff and, and the rain and the eerie underground coven stuff at the beginning all that stuff i just it kind of gives me chills you know it's really cool um and then you kind of come back to haddonfield and you sort of get to revisit you know this peaceful little american town and and all of that stuff i think is is works beautifully it's not until it, that third act and and they kind of just she jumps out that window and then the movie just sort of like it's like she's she's taking the movie with her it always sort of did feel even in the original that there was something always off about the town of Haddonfield. Right, right. That's true. Yeah. I mean, and I think that was a little bit of what we were building to had we continued our, you know, version of the story and, and continue to develop that that plot line. But yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. We were building to the idea that every small town has a secret, you know, and and you know, what if this town was harboring this greater evil and and the reason they were doing it was kind of a survival of a fittest you know if if we don't let if we don't offer these sacrifices and, and michael being the one to deliver them he's infected with this kind of boogeyman satanic druidic curse that their own lives will fail you know they're they're their safe their safety will be compromised like this is like other than michael myers this is like the safest place to live you, you not there's the, the crime rate is almost zero you know? so, but in their weird you know like a lot of people with religious beliefs believe that you know it's all a sign from god and they're everything they do is for um you know for that greater good everything has got to be a sacrifice and um and I think that's creepy. There's a there's a short story, a really famous one called The Lottery, written by Shirley Jackson. So if I've, if you've never read it, I you know it's it's a quick 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 read. I think it's maybe twenty pages. Um, and I think some of the ideas for Halloween Six were inspired by The Lottery. I'll just say that. So if you read that, you'll maybe you'll see kind of where the story was going to go. Cool, cool. I'll definitely try to check it out. Um, there's been news about a potential Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. Would you throw your hat in if? Sure. You know, listen, my, uh, my, I, I, I owe a lot to Friday the 13th. In fact, kind of my career in a weird way. I mean, certainly more to Halloween, but, but, but in a, in a, in a different way to Friday the 13th, because my very first acknowledgement from anybody in Hollywood was from a producer named Frank Mancuso Jr., who was Mr. Friday the 13th. He was the young producer who, you know, guided that franchise during all of the early years, the Paramount years, up until part eight. And Frank, I wrote him a letter when I was 14 and he wrote back to me. And I still have his response framed on my desk. I can see it as we speak. Um, and it was just the most um, affirming, kind, and encouraging thing that I could have gotten at that age and I needed that and he saw something in me so you know he's you know he, he and and in the letter he's like I have never taken the time to write back to a single Friday the 13th fan until I got your letter and there's something here that I can't believe you're your age and you're writing better than people 20 years older than you don't give up don't don't let anybody dissuade you you've got something here and I am here to encourage and hope that you go far so it was that kind of a letter that you know for me that was like oh my god you know the hand of you know the savior had touched me you know <laughs> so, so yeah for that reason you know of course it would be an honor and privilege to to, to have my you know name on a friday the 13th film but you know i've had my hand in the franchise to the extent that i was involved in uh, Peter Brackey's amazing book, Crystallic Memories, um, which we collaborated on. He was certainly the brain power behind it, but I was, you know, I was kind of a, the stilts holding the, the house up, if you will. 
uh, we, we made that book as kind of a team effort and, and it was successful and um, fans seemed to really, really love it. And then we went on and did a documentary based on the book that I directed and and it was a seven hour retrospective on Friday the 13th. So, you know, all the Friday the 13th legacy lives large in my heart. <laughs> so for sure. Do you think we'll ever see Michael versus Jason? I don't think so. I, I, I my feeling and I think the, the the powers that be, especially behind the Halloween franchise, would agree with me. It just cheapens the whole thing. It just feels cheesy and I don't think that's the way that it's I, I, I can almost just, and of course I'll say that next year they'll announce that they're making that movie. But yeah, I from what I know and conversations I've had with, you know, the people that make these decisions about it. That's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah, it's. I think that ship has sailed. <laughs> it's sailed, and it's also kind of like really, like you know, I don't know. I just, I don't think that. I don't honestly. I don't think Freddie and Jason belong together. I guess that was fun in some respects, but I just felt very forced and ultra goofy to me. And I, you know, I don't know. I just didn't. I don't. I'm just not a fan of that kind of stuff. It's just too comic booky and. You know, I think I think if anything, what David Gordon Green and his group of, you know, people have done is just kind of grounded the whole thing back to, you know, the town and glory yeah. and, you know, kind of discarded everything else. But that's OK. You know, like everything's a reinvention these days. So I'm not offended. Not that much. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh goodness! No, I have no more questions for you, Dan- Daniel Ferentz. Um The Halloween box set is coming out. That's <laughs> with right. Halloween six. Yep. yep. I'll leave the link in the description box where you can go pick that up. Is there anything you want to plug before you go? Well, no. I mean, other than just you know, it's Halloween six, the very first time, and and it's the theatrical edition, not the not the producer's cut, from what I understand. But it's um. Uh, it, it maybe is producers cut too. I can't remember if they announced that was part of it, but I, but I know I didn't do a commentary on that one. I did Marianne Hagen and I, and for the first time did a do a, did a commentary on Halloween Six, but it's on the theatrical version. But the cool thing is, it's the first time the movie's ever been released in 4K. So that's I think what sets this particular release apart from the earlier ones. It's 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 in the highest definition available. Um, until next year when there's 8K and 12K and, you know, <laughs> so, but no, listen, it's always nice when I get a call and they want to do something new with it and um, I'm always game and I'm just so humbled and appreciative of, appreciative of all the attention the movie gets after all these years. It's really something else. You know what? There is a franchise I would like to see you write. Okay. Phantasm. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, that would be really fun. Um, I can't say that I have the acumen on the Phantasm franchise that I think I do with the other ones. But yeah, it'd be super fun. And, um, you know, more, you know, more ball. We'll, we'll, we'll all have a ball. I'm trying to think of some clever pun, but it's not happening. <laughs> the more killer ball fun. Killer, killer, killer ball fun. That's what we need. <laughs> Like, I'm remember back then, I, you're big, you're too young, but they, we used to have these things called color forms in the 70s. So, so, so color forms, it's the killer ball, killer <laughs> ball. It was like these little, like plastic little stickers and you'd put them on things and, but they wouldn't stick. They would kind of peel off and they weren't, they, there was no right adhesive. It was almost like a static cling kind of a thing, but we just loved color forms in the 70s. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> Don't know why I mentioned that, but we did. Uh, um <laughs> First of all, thank you, thank you, Daniel Ferens. For oh my God, for sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, and thanks for you know your your patience and you know waiting to get me on your on your show here, and also just you know your love of this movie. I it's, it touches my heart, so thank you very much. I always like I did two vi- I did like some videos of the cult of Thorn on a oh Michael wow Mar- on Michael Myers <laughs> oh, Wow, you are the you are the super fan of Halloween Six. I I love it. I think it's a uh-huh. great movie. I again it's it's a movies for me are like memories of course so, so. And, and that's what i think is so great is that that was the first one you that you experienced on a in a movie theater and it made an impression on you and you know that it makes perfect sense i hear from a lot of people of your age that um, 
had that experience and and are so you know i think they were awed by that movie maybe it was the visuals and the you know the mask and the the energy of the thing and and i think that's again i i, I couldn't ask for more so thank you i'm, I'm sorry I, I did have one more i'm sorry no go 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 you're fine it's can you believe that it's been 27 years no <laughs> so you just made me feel really 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 old it was just my 53rd birthday on this past saturday and that was unbelievable and to think that i was only 24 when i wrote halloween six uh, I think uh, I I think I still hold the record for the youngest writer on the series. I think uh, I don't think anybody. I think John Carpenter was thirty when he made the first movie. So I, I I I am by far the the baby when it comes to the people that you know got a writing credit on a movie. <laughs> I think to this day I don't think anybody's younger than I was at the time. Age is just a number. Uh, Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, don't I don't. <laughs> When you get to my age, you probably won't. You'll start to say other things, but it's okay. You know, it's just. <laughs> well, it's, my daughter just became a teenager. So. Wow, isn't it amazing? You're right, and she's going to be the age you were when you saw our film, or probably already is. So it's amazing. I, I showed her. Well, I showed my kids all these movies when they were a lot younger. Uh huh. They've already seen Halloween Six, and my my I remember my daughter saying, "Daddy, that man in black, he's creepy." <laughs> he's creepy. He was. I, I wish he, I wish he'd have been creepier, but uh, but you know that's in another story universe somewhere. But uh, but yeah, no, I, I encourage you go read go read if you can find it. It's probably even online. Um, Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. You'll you'll kind of see the. I most yeah. definitely will. Yeah, it's a classic story. It's it's very well known. In fact, I think it was required reading in maybe junior high or something like that. But I remember I gasped at the ending. You know, it was wow. just like, oh my god. So, uh, but yeah, good yeah. stuff. There's a lot of edgy old stories out there. Mm -hmm. Like really shape us, I think. Oh, for sure. You know, going from, you know, and I even, you know, you back to Edgar Allan Poe stories and things like that. But <clears throat> I think also prior to my generation, you know, I think it was, it was the Twilight Zone generation. And I think, you know, Rod Serling's contributions to the genre cannot be ignored. Um, and his whole coterie of of writers around and Richard Matheson and that whole group of people were just incredibly brilliant. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank, thank you. For yeah, your yeah, thank so you. Much. For yeah. sure, for sure. And listen, thank you for the, you know, again, but also happy Halloween to you and your family, all your listeners and, uh, you know, evil never dies. So I'm sure we'll be seeing more and more and more My Michael Myers and Halloween in the future. Hopefully, I think. All right. The, the fan base isn't going in. <laughs> no, it's not. That's exactly it. You're right. You are right. But, but thank you. You have a great night. You do the same. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.